Duke University history professor Martin Miller is the author of this book, The Foundations of Modern Terror, State, Society, and the Dynamics of Political Violence. Professor Miller, is there a working definition of modern terrorism? Well, what I have tried to do is to formulate one, which is a perilous path because so many others have tried. There's a book length monograph on just that, definitions. So I think that the clearest way to understand what I've tried to do is to refer back to what in fact are two kinds of perspectives. One is the idea that governments and especially dictators exercise terror against their own citizens, uh, the Hitlers, the Stalins, the Pol Pots of the world. And the other is the world of post 9-11 that we're most familiar with, which is the insurgencies uh, from below who seem to pose, uh, and so we're told, and sometimes we, really, we realize how serious the threat is, that they are in fact a danger to us. So what I've tried to do in this book in defining terrorism is to bring together those two strands, to understand that it's an interactive process between governments and their security agencies on the one hand, and insurgencies uh, with their international networks on the other. It's the interactive process that has fascinated me. And I want to read two statements from the introduction to your book and have you explain those a little further. Perhaps because those in power are inherently suspicious of claims challenging the legitimacy of their authority, and because those who are without political power covet it so desperately, all the parties involved in the violence are vulnerable to exaggerating their roles. And terrorism is a way of seeing the world, of understanding, or in many cases misunderstanding, the dominant political paradigm of the particular historical moment. Right, yeah, you've, you've picked out some pregnant passages. I think uh, on the one hand, what we're talking about here is the question of accepting the legitimacies of governments. We talk about failed states, we talk about varieties of kinds of governments, dictatorships, authoritarian governments, democratic governments, but what I'm interested in is, and maybe this w might be a way of explaining it, S uh, this is a 200-year-old story, even more than that. Since the time of the French Revolution, in brief, we have faced a situation in which we don't really know what legitimate government is anymore. There was a time before the French Revolution when monarchies ruled the world and it was all very clear and monolithic and largely unquestioned. Everyone has now an assumption of right with regard to deciding what politics ought to be dominant and which politics ought to be seen as threatening and dangerous. That means that you your opinion, my opinion, um, are as valid as the people who in fact are in power. So there is that treacherous path of understanding how it is that governments who seem so strong uh, and so convinced of their authority really aren't. That's one side. The other side is that yes, people who feel that their views are not being uh, paid attention to, who feel that they have an answer that's more right than and more valid, and will create a more just world um, than the government in power at the moment, takes upon itself to use various tactics to bring that change about. When all else fails, uh, violence comes into play, and then we have situations of, of terrorism. So it, it, it's a very long, enduring uh, involvement between two sides, and it is, yes, a way of seeing the world because once you, I like to call it, go underground, that is to say, once you leave the conventional world that you and I live in and participate, let's say, if you're talking about insurgencies joining one or another of, of those movements, you have removed yourself um, from the legal and moral codes that most of us live with. The same thing happens to be true in governments. It's a world of utter secrecy. We are protected um, by those governments and they have knowledge that we are not supposed to have because by having it, we are endangering national security. This is the, um, the, the way we are to understand it. What's fascinating to me is when these two worlds interact with each other, when they provoke each other, when they become agents um, within the organizational structure of the opposite side and adopt their habits. So that's part of the way of seeing the world. When you're in a clandestine situation, it's very difficult to understand, and you can't go back once you're there, 
uh, to understand the world that you left behind. What's one of the uh, examples of the interaction between government and terrorists that you speak of? There are many, but uh, I think s one or two of the most emblematic um, take me back to Russia. And, I, and, and in the book, um, as I'm sure you know, I, I, I have a, a vast canvas that I, I look at Western Europe, um, Russia, um, and Latin America, and other countries as well. One of the best examples is the situation that takes place in Russia. There was, and I'll give you just one example, uh, which is admittedly is n not the most common, but it's uh, an exaggerated example of what goes on all the time. A, a person who is hired by the security agency of the government to become a mole um, in an insurgent organization, let me try not to mention names because it'll simply be confusing, but um, you'll be familiar with the type. So this person then um, is on the payroll of the government. He goes underground, joins a, a revolutionary organization, an insurgency. That's, a, in fact, a, a very violent group that's seeking to overthrow that very government. One day, and this is what I will, I think, best response uh, I can think of to your question, one day um, that person is charged with the action, tactic, of essentially assassinating his boss in the government who was, let's say, the prime minister, which happened at least on two occasions that I know about um, in the period of Imperial Russia before the revolution of 1917. And so the person then has a choice. Does he blow his cover? Uh, or does he, in fact, um, carry out the assignment with all the perils involved? In, th in the two cases that I know about, um, and th they're documented in my book, in each of those cases, they decided not to blow their cover, and they ended up killing their boss, the prime minister. So um, the interactive process at that point was so intense that they were imitating each other. Um, their documents, um, the, the, the documents that were produced at the time by both the government and the insurgents um, are almost replicas of one another because they're fascinated by the other side at the same time that they're trying to take them out. Did 9-11 change our understanding of how terrorism acts? Huge. Huge. One of the things I tell my students all the time is, please read the Patriot Act. Uh, I rarely meet anyone who's actually read it. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a document that explains so much of the uh, passion and heat uh, of, yes, the post-9-11 world. When I try and introduce this theme to my students, which um, I, I'm doing now that this book is out, I've, I've been using it for the first time in my class, one of my students, I think, made a wonderful comment. She said, we are the children of 9-11. How can we possibly understand that our government might be involved in the very things that we're calling terrorism? That said so much to me somehow, how difficult the gap was from where I'm coming from, which is an experience that goes back from the 1960s and 70s, years spent um, doing research in the Soviet Union, to the passion of understanding that the Islamic world is now what the communists and the anarchists um, and other enemies of the state have always been. Back to the 60s, in the U.S., the Weather Underground, the Black Panthers, were those terrorist groups? They were, but the terrorism of the situation involves an understanding of exactly what I'm talking about, the fact that the FBI and the CIA were deeply involved in sending uh, their own agents into these organizations. And in some cases, and I have evidence for this as well in the book, it's, I don't think it's any secret anymore, all oh, uh, these documents are public, <coughs> of actually provoking, in some cases, acts of violence because the insurgent organization, this has certainly been tr was true of the Black Panthers many times, they weren't doing what they were supposed to do in terms of violence at that particular moment. So the government agent who's actually surveilling them from within provokes the situation, takes it upon him or herself to create the violent act. That'll allow then the forces of law and order to make the arrests that they want to do anyway. So th that happened over and over again. Was 9-11 a political act? 9-11 is a complicated story, and for historians, it's still something that we don't um, fully understand and can't yet until we have all the, the two Ds, as I tell my students, the distance and the documents um, that we need to fully understand it. 9-11 was um, a, an act of a, of a 